Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast, brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, what's up, everybody? Want you to picture something. So picture this. It's hot. You're in the desert. There's prickly pears. There's cactus, loose rock, and you're hunting bears. So that's right. <laughs> I set up bears. I'm sitting. I'm sitting down with uh, with Josh Kirchner today, and we're going to talk about. I think what is kind of like somewhat of an unknown hunt, maybe maybe a hunt or an opportunity that a lot of folks maybe don't think about or even have a hard time picturing. I know when I first heard about this hunt, I was like, really? I just I didn't even picture that there would be bears in Arizona. You know, nope. most people don't. <laughs> yeah, you think uh, they're black. They've got these big heavy coats, but pretty darn good bear state. So before we before we get too deep into this, like I said, we've got Josh Kirchner here, Arizona resident, really, really uh, good hunter, got a lot of experience down there. And uh, so Josh, before, like I said, before we get too deep, introduce yourself and kind of let us know who you are and, and what you're about. Yeah, my name is Josh Kirchner, live down in Arizona, um, do a lot of hunting, kind of, you know, dad got me into that when I was younger. Mm-hmm kind of an annual deer camp thing. And then, uh, but that was kind of as far as that went when I was a child. Mm-hmm. And when I got older, mid twenties, I just, I was like, man, I just really want to learn how to do this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, cause we were, I mean, in all honesty, we were very unsuccessful hunters when I was a kid. Okay. Right. So then I just kind of grabbed the bull by the horns and was like, I'm going to learn how to do this. Right. And, uh, that's what I did. Yeah. And I just been, since my mid twenties, I'm 34 now. Now I just been obsessed with Bear hunting and bow hunting and everything hunting in Arizona, you know? That's and, so cool, man. Yeah, and for some reason, the bear thing, like, I hunted deer, you know, with my dad when I was a kid, but the bear thing seemed like this, this, like, forbidden fruit, if you would. Okay. It was like, it sounded like the most wild thing that I could go after. Right, <laughs> you know? right. And plus, I had never really seen bears at all. They're so, they're so secretive. Right. You know, so I never saw a bear when I was a kid, and I remember... The first time I did see a bear, that really just like stayed burnt in my memory. Just kind of, yeah. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, it was a giant chocolate bear crossing the road. Did not care at all that there were people there, you know, just had this like swagger to him and confidence that you just don't normally see in animals. Right. You know, so it was incredibly different to me. Like you see deer oftentimes, you know, they're, they bounce out, you know, they want to get away from you. Yeah. This this bear was like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like that's like kind of like the, but possibly I could be wrong, but like almost like the mark of a big bear. Like you said, they've got like that, they've got that swagger, that confidence. They're like, uh, yeah, I'm kind of the the king of the jungle or or the desert in this case out (laughs) here, you know, out where you're at. But, um, yeah, that's interesting. Well, what was the, um, like what was that catalyst that you're, that almost kind of like rekindled that spark to, uh, start that hunting journey? Yeah. So, like I said, I had the interest in bears from the start, but what really, really solidified it for me was I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, right? Took the first year and I'm, I'm going to hunt bears. I went out and it was with a buddy. He was hunting deer. I was hunting bears. We split up and there was a water hole that I found some bear sign around. Still hadn't seen one, you mm-hmm. know? And I was like, the sign that I found was it was stuff I read in books. So it was like, it wasn't from experience. It was like, well, this is what the books say bear sign looks like. Okay. Right. <laughs> like, right. So that's kind of all I had to go off of. So the first evening, my buddy's hunting this group of deer over in this other basin. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to stay over here on this water hole. Cause I don't want to mess up his hunt. Mm-hmm. So I'm just sitting there. And then at seven o'clock, right before dark, just this big black blob comes walking out of the brush. No way. And it was one of those things where I was like, I, I like forgot to bring my rifle scope up to my eye because I was like so sh- strucken. Right. You know, long story short, I never got a shot on that bear just because he kept like intertwining through these, through the scrub oaks and never had a clear shot. Started calling at him right away when, okay. he, when he went into the brush and he did come at me, but he was behind this huge tree. So I had no shot. Right. From that point, I was like, just different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, I was like, I need to learn how to do this. That was amazing. Watching a bear kind of walk around and do his thing. Bears are so unpredictable. You never know what they're going to do. I feel like when you're watching deer and elk, you know, they're fairly predictable. You know, they're feeding. Maybe they're going to go bed down a bear. Man, he could just, he could climb a tree. He could roll around on the ground like a dog. Int- yeah, right. Go, go for a swim, wade around. Like, it, just really interesting watching how 
they feed and how delicate they are grabbing acorns off of a bush. Just, just like really interesting to me. You know what I mean? So yeah, from that point forward, it was like just full, full bore. <laughs> no, <laughs> pun no, no pun intended. No. <laughs> Somebody had to say it. Somebody had to yeah, say yeah, it. Yeah. But no, man, I can get that. Just like have an experience like that. Like obviously having like that initial interest, right. Yeah. And just in kind of being, uh, like you said, they're so they're secretive. I mean, they're kind of mystical in a in a way. For maybe that's not the right word at it, all, but they're just. I think it is the right word. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then, like, just to yeah, just to have that experience. I yeah. can just see that just setting that on fire for yeah. you. So Arizona is a like I said, it's not the state that I think of first when I picture bear habitat. Right. Right. So you were talking about you know scrub oaks and mm-hmm. things like that, and which are aren't necessarily everywhere. Right. So right. what where where are you finding these bears, you know, even, or maybe even let's even take a step back and look, uh, look down on the subject, like, like regionally, where can you find bears in the state of Arizona? Are, are they everywhere? Are they down South or? Uh, black bears certainly aren't everywhere in the state. Um, I would say they're kind of focused to like the North, Northern Arizona and Northeastern Arizona, as well as, uh, portions of Southern Arizona. Okay. And they're in pockets. You know okay. what I mean? They, they require, in my opinion, they require the most rugged of the rugged country. They love deep, moist canyons Okay, um, that often hold water. And I think, the, I think these canyons are often act as like mini ecosystems of their own, you okay. know? And then outside of that, it's, you know, it might be fairly dry, but in the canyon, there might, you go on the bottom and it's almost like a different world. You know, it pools of water and like, grapes growing and stuff like that. Just unbelievable. It's almost like a true oasis. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. And, and do you find, or do you think that they're spending a lot of time down in there? Like, are, are they spending a lot of their day down there, but probably, I guess, feeding maybe to some degree on, on yeah. some of the things that are available, but, yeah. but before they go and maybe, you know, hit some other food sources? Yeah. So I'm a firm believer that if that bear, say we're looking at a canyon, okay. if there's a bear in there and he has everything that he needs in that canyon... Outside of breeding season, I think he's not, he, he's, there's no reason for him to leave. Gotcha. But food changes throughout the year. Like bears don't eat the same thing all year round. So maybe in the springtime, you know, they're more focused on grass and maybe down in that canyon, maybe it's too thick to grow really good grass. So maybe they will venture out and find open hillsides. Okay, sure. To find grass. And that's really the name of the game is following the food with the year. Gotcha. You know, like as the year progresses, we start, you know, we have a spring season too. I know you want to talk about fall, but we have a spring season too. So springtime, you're focused on green grass, flowers, berries, they're eating termites, stuff like that. Sure. And then they'll, they'll transition into uh, like the mast crops, like acorns and stuff like that. Prickly pear fruit starts coming out at that time around August. Okay, right. And then after that, there's, a nu- there's another s- species of oak that'll ripen, a bigger acorn called a gamble oak. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, those, are, those get about like the size of a quarter, okay. those acorns. I mean, you'll see them climbing those trees and like shaking the branches, trying to make the acorns fall down, you know? <laughs> like, yep. And then uh, juniper berries uh, is another one. And then they're also, I mean, they're opportunistic feeders, you know what I mean? They're predators. Mm-hmm. So if we rewind and go tr- into like June and July when the fawns drop... I mean, if a bear hears a fawn, you know, crying, it's like, it's a dinner bell. Yeah. You know what I mean? All he's got to do is go up and snatch it. So that's kind of the name of the game with bear hunting. And I think, I think that's where a lot of people have issues, um, transitioning between spring and fall, because in the springtime, they'll go try and hunt them where they hunt them in the fall. Okay. And that's just not like, (laughs) you got to hunt bears where they are. Gotcha. You know, so. How does that, you know, and of course, you know, we always say like, check your, check your regulations before you go on any hunt. But like, so I believe like. That early season bow hunt, I want to say that's an over-the-counter opportunity. Are a lot of the other hunts on a draw or most of them over-the-counter or? So, yeah. So that hunt, we we only have one uh, hunt that's a draw for bear. Okay. And it's a spring archery hunt. It runs from, I believe it's middle, uh, early to middle of May until July 31st. Okay. Outside of that, everything's over-the-counter. Like we have an over-the-counter spring season before that starts in uh, end of March runs to the first part of May. Mm-hmm. All right. And then you got that draw hunt that goes until July 31st. After that, the fall hunts start to open in certain units around like August 10th. 
Okay. So a few, a few units will open then. The rest of the units will open at the end of August. That hunt will close in the mid, in middle of September, and then another hunt opens in the beginning of October and runs till December 31st. Amazing. So maybe I was thinking of that incorrectly. Are these... Are most of those weapon specific hunts, or are the, or is it uh, any weapon? So the only one that's weapon specific is the draw hunt. It's an archery tag. Okay. Yeah. All the other ones are general tags. You can use a rifle, bow. It doesn't matter. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Really cool. I mean, yeah. You talk. I mean, what an awesome mm-hmm. opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Especially for you know, I mean, the bow hunting thing. Like, it's definitely like bow hunting is like quote unquote cool right now. You know what I mean? So I don't blame anybody for grabbing a bow, but it's like, especially if you're starting out, man, there's no shame in grabbing a rifle, you know, and going out and going on your first bear hunt. Cause no often, way. oftentimes you're seeing these bears in areas where it's like, if you're hunting with a bow, you're like, uh, I don't even know if I can get there. Sure. You know, like, yeah. you know to plan like a good stock. So a rifle just seems a lot more feasible a lot of times. Yeah, you know what I mean? And particularly for, you know, an out-of-stater, right? Mm-hmm. You're probably going to commit, I'd say in general, you got maximum a week, you mm-hmm. know, maybe you got five days connected by weekends. You may not be familiar with the country and maybe, you've, you know, you've uh, aerial scouted it or maybe, you know, talked to some folks and done some research. But, you know, I mean, I think we all know once once your boots hit the ground, mm-hmm. you know, everything looks different. Oh, yeah. You know, things are just, everything changes. I mean, you definitely get a ton of insight from that aerial stuff. Oh yeah. But you know, so you got that week to figure it out. And, and like you said, no shame in grabbing. I love to rifle. I love to bow hunt. I love to rifle hunt. Love the yeah. muzzleloader hunt. I mean, really, you know, whatever the opportunity may be, but yeah, that, that, that's a cool one. I, for whatever reason, I was thinking that it was, it was an archery, an early archery hunt. Maybe that's cause I've got, I've had this archery coos deer hunt on my brain oh, yeah. so much <laughs> lately. That's like, but, um, dude, that's, that's cool. And the cool thing about, you know, just little side tangent you said archery coups that late august hunt uh that i mentioned that's over the counter for bear that is a mixed bag hunt okay so you can do so bear is open fall turkey is open which is that's an archery tag the turkey tag okay and then uh archery deer so so i mean this is a very hot time of year so if you're sitting you could you sit on a water source and it happens to be dry I mean, who knows what's going to walk in. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you can have a bear walk in, a mule deer, a coos deer. You know, like, it could be pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, a, guy, a person might be uh, a good idea to, you know, throw that tag in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I would, for sure. Man, that's cool. So, one thing that seems consistent, you know, talking with you even, you know, before this podcast and also even just what we've been talking about is, like, food, right? Mm-hmm. It seems like bears, I mean, they're kind of slaves to their stomach no matter what the yeah. time of year. So, you know, you talked about the spring hunt, which, you know, a lot of other places you're, you're looking for, you know, grasses and that first early spring green up, you know, they're trying to get their systems on track. Uh, there's not a ton of food available. Those, those mass crops generally, you know, aren't around, but during that fall season, you brought up like the prickly pears and that's, that mm-hmm. was the one first thing that I heard about. I was like, man, that is so unique, you know? So maybe, maybe talk about those those pears that, that come and you said about August. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the prickly pear phenomena is like, a the conditions have to be right for that. Okay. Okay. So bears are in general, fairly lazy creatures. <laughs> right. Okay. So what I'm getting at is if they're up high and they have acorns, most of the bears are not going to drop down into the prickly pears because they don't have to. Gotcha. Right. But I mean, what was it? Two years I think it was two years ago. Uh, we had a horrible uh, winter um, moisture. Like it was, ho- we had little to no rain. Okay. Which is vital for acorn reproduction. Okay. I found two acorns in the canyon I normally hunt in. So like there was no acorns around, there's no bears. All right. And what I tell people is like, if there's no food, don't even waste your time. Okay. You got to look in another area. So that year, man, the bears were, they were dropping down in the desert. You see them walking around by cactus. It's like super, super weird. And they crawl right on top of those prickly pears. You got to give it to them because they, you know, they're getting all poked up and stuff. Oh (laughs) man. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's when they're going to eat the pears. You know, and that's interesting to hear that they'll not ignore, but you know, bears just, they just seem like they kind of have a sweet tooth, you know, Mm -hmm. and I I tasted one of those pears. It was kind of a, I think it was probably on its way out Mm because this was January, right? I was like, I got to try try this thing, at least taste it. Right. So we cut it open and yeah, also, yeah, those bears. So 
you know, not super familiar with the desert, but I should have, I guess, known because every plant does want to poke you. But mm -hmm. on that prickly pear fruit, you know, it appeared to be ripe. It's kind of like, uh, you know, purple yep. in color. A little, little dried up, but, you know, purple in color. So I, I grabbed it and I pulled it off. And it almost looked like these just kind of benign, soft hairs yep. on it, which um, they, they weren't at all because I still think I have them uh, in my hand. Yes. Uh, so anyway, we cut it open. And it, I mean, to me, it tasted exactly like a regular pear that you might get at the grocery store. They're, um, they're delicious. My wife and I, uh, we make ja uh, jelly out of them. Okay. Yeah, we'll go out in, in during that time in August and just take bushels of prickly pear fruit back home and peel all that skin off, and she makes jelly. It's awesome. Probably not handling them uh, barehanded like we, I did. We then. use tongs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. An unpro tip from me and a pro tip from Josh, you know, use tongs, get, yeah. get those things off. But they, they do. They look, they almost look like uh, like hair or yeah. like almost like a fur, but they definitely like to. Like, it's like it's to almost like it. fiberglass. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good analogy. But uh, delicious. But I, I would have thought that given the opportunity, like the bears would be like, no, I want, I want those pears because they're just, you know, delicious, sweet, sugary. There are bears. Here's another thing I believe. Like, I believe that if a mom has a couple cubs and her routine is okay. going down into the prickly pears in August, I believe those bears will do that just because their mom told them to. Like, Every year, bears will drop down into the prickly pears. It's just a number game. Okay, right. You know what I mean? So if you're mm -hmm. going off of, like, best case scenario, yeah, you can find them in the pears any year. Right. Right? But if you want to find most of the bears, you need to fi find most of the food. Right. You know what right. I mean? So, yeah. Very cool. Well, what else? So, so it sounds like you've hunted them with the rifle mm -hmm. and the bow then. Yeah. I guess what else kind of goes into this hunt as far as, as, as planning or what are some other things that a person might want to think about? Um, I would definitely, uh, optics are king with bear hunting in Arizona. That's how we find 95% of our bears. Okay. I, I'll also set trail cameras and stuff down in thick uh, canyons where you can't really see. Right. Because bears, they love their water. Okay. They'll swim in it, bathe in it, play in it and obviously drink it, you right. know, and in certain times of year, they're going to water multiple times a day. So, so if you, you know, if you have some trail cameras, that might be a re really beneficial thing to do. But other than that, man, what we're doing is we're really focusing on canyons and sitting up high, sitting down in August, being there before the sun comes up is absolutely crucial. Okay. Right. Because it gets so hot. Yep. You know, and Picture you being a bear walking around in the summer. They got a big coat on, you know what I mean? So yep. they're most active very first thing in the morning, right before dark. So you need to be there before the sun comes up. And I would just really, really peer into, like if you're hunting scrub oaks or whatever, just peer into those oaks with your, with your binos. Okay. And a lot of times what you can do is you can hear them. So you'll be standing up on top of a can, you can hear brush breaking okay but you can't see them and what they're doing is they just go right into these scrub oaks and if you get down in there and get down on your knees and look around you'll see little tunnels okay yeah and i've run into this from from blood trailing bears before you know okay and it's unreal it's like i just i call them bear tunnels yeah yeah you know but then if you key in on that noise all of a sudden you'll see you might see like a head pop out you know what I mean? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> and, uh, and there you go. And there's your bear. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's really what it's all about. It's focusing on food, man. That's, yeah. that's really what it's all about. Glassing, focusing on food. And then, uh, that time of year, uh, because it's all about the food, the food is also the Achilles heel of the bear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if you see a bear and he's in, say you see him in the morning and he's in, he's coming into like a little patch of acorns and then he goes off and you don't get a shot. Right. Nine times out of ten, that bear's going to come right back to that same oak patch okay, that, gotcha. that evening. Gotcha. They're very habitual like that. They're also very um, territorial. Okay. So, like, one year, uh, sitting sitting at the, in this spring, and the bears were fighting down in this canyon. Okay. You know, like, because of food. Okay, right. They're, they're getting in right. fights over food. And I, I was sitting down there, and I saw this one smaller bear walking along this bluff. And then all of a sudden, he looks over to his left... And he stops what he, everything he's doing, 
And about two seconds later, he runs as fast as he can down into the bottom of the canyon. And then I just see this massive boar come walking out, you know, and just claim that food from him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> another, another, uh, kind of outside of the tactics, just, just so people know how crucial the food is, they will travel. Game and Fish has collared bears before. They will travel up to like 100 miles for food. Wild. Yeah, so I, th- I believe I read one study. They, they started off on, people can look up geographically where this is, but they started off on the Mugion Rim, mm-hmm. and then two bears together, possibly siblings, just went on a walk all the way to Crown King, which mm-hmm. is a, a long ways, and then just walked back. And it was because of food. That was a very dry year. Okay. So they were going down into the desert trying to find prickly pears and they need food. Just really, really search in there. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that was such a good a good tip earlier. And it seems like, you know, pretty consistent with what I've seen spring bear hunting. But, you know, like if you see one in the morning, you know, he could be really, really far off. Like mm-hmm. you said, maybe he slips away before you can get on him. But, mm-hmm. you know, now you've got all day to put yourself into a position on that food source mm-hmm. and, and wait for him to come out that evening. And I think uh, that's just a really, really good great thing to point out that just because he's gone now it doesn't mean that the game's over and you got to go find another beer bear or a beer i don't know um you know, <laughs> maybe when you're taking a break no i don't know don't do that but um but like i said that that game's not over in fact you probably have your absolute best tip that you could yeah. have had and if patience isn't your thing and you got a couple pairs of underwear with you you can if that bear goes into a bedding area okay and retreats away from that food source you can sneak in there and just bring a predator call okay, and just start squawking on that thing. And you could very well just bring him back out of his bed to check out what's going on. Predator calling a bear that is actively eating mm-hmm. is very difficult. Sure. Because he, he's like, I, I got food right here. He already he, has what he wants. You know what I mean? But if he's over there bedding, you know, and he hears something, you sneak in there and you start calling, mm-hmm. that's, that's an opportunity. You yep. know what I mean? And they are an opportunistic animal, so... Yeah, interesting. What kind of, if you are going to call, I guess, what type of setup are you looking for? Are you looking to, to get in fairly tight into that cover so it's a little bit more, I guess, close quarters? So, you know, when he comes out, he's like maybe not going to, you know, they, they don't have the best vision, I guess, but that's not the worst in the world either. So are, are you trying to conceal yourself at all or do you actually hang out? closer to that food source that that bear was hitting or what are you doing there? Uh, To me, in this case, topography is the king here. And I, and I really relate it to calling any animal, whether it's elk or coyotes, it doesn't matter. You're, you want to try to make him come to a certain area. So let's say we're looking at a finger, right? Mm -hmm. If the bear is off that finger, I would want to set up on top of that finger to make him, because you can't see up on top. Right. Right. So he'll have to come up on top of that finger to see what's going on, which hopefully you'll get a shot at that point. Right. And oftentimes these areas, they're not open. Like as far as like, uh, as far as like vegetation, you okay, know, right. they're usually pretty dense. Okay. Gotcha. So it's going to be close, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see, find the food you can call them. And if you are going to do that, then bring Extra underwear. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Check. <laughs> uh, I've act- I've called in a couple bears. I called in one back when I lived in Washington, actually in in the summertime with uh, with a fawn bleat, mm-hmm. and then I was with a buddy and we called one in just kind of with like a classic. I guess you know it was more of like a rabbit squeal. Mm-hmm. So and that was actually a case similar to yours where we had spotted a bear really far away, mm-hmm. uh, crossed a couple drainages to get over to him. He he wasn't there. And uh, we called, and, and we were able to draw him out into an opening yep. uh, where the, the uh, was uh, the three of us. I'd actually filled my tag a couple days earlier, and uh, it was uh, it was such a it was such a big bear. And the guy, you know, I mean, heck, I've missed before, but he missed it, and it was, it was a really it was a big, really big <laughs> black bear. Bummer, but it's just the name of the game, though. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. happens, you know. Absolutely. But, so that was that was super cool. But what type of sound are you using then? So I had a mentor right when I was coming into the whole bear hunting scene. And his thing, like, he was very convinced that the bears were too smart for an electronic call. Okay, right. Because it's on an audio loop. Sure. Now, those work. Mm-hmm. Okay, You've, I've seen videos of it working. It's fine. But for him, he was like, I want to sound like 
I am being absolutely ripped to shreds. It almost sounds like it, like a pig squeal, what he was doing. Okay, Just sure. Just very intense and constantly for about an hour mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. a hand call. Bears are, they lose um, their train of thought pretty easy. They don't have a big attention span. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's watched them, and I've seen this too, when you're calling, if you stop, mm-hmm. it, let's say the bear's coming towards you, if you stop and he finds a food source, He's just gonna he's just gonna go right there and eat berries or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? But I think it also has to do with uh, how close you are to that bear. And this means if you can see the bear. Mm-hmm. So earlier this year or uh, last year in August, I spotted a bear about a mile out eating prickly pears. And my plan, you know, I had my bow, I was planning on just going over there, stalking in and trying to get a shot when he's keyed in on that food. Well, we ended up crossing paths and he went up the opposite side of the canyon of me. He's about 350 yards away walking away from me. So at that point, I'm like, well, yeah, big bucks, no whammies. You know what I mean? I'm just going to get my call out and try. But because he was so close, I just did it very subtle. Okay. Instead of just like right away. Yeah, yeah. And I started doing that and that bear stopped on a dime. It turned his head and then started charging as fast as he could across the canyon up to me. And I got the bear to 40 yards, but then my wind hit him and he took off. Oh, man. So it's just like, it, it's, that works. You know what I mean? So I think like a good rule of thumb if, is if you're, it's very similar to elk, calling elk. Like if you're going to an area, uh, maybe right when you're starting to blind call, mm-hmm. maybe start soft. Right. Just in case there is anything like right around you. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of like build from there. Yep. Kind of, kind of. And you're telling a story. Yep. You know what I mean? Because like right off the bat, it's like, what are you going to hear? Like if an animal gets attacked, you know what I mean? It's like, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I know, uh, that's the, the cool part about mouth calls I feel is you can impart a lot of emotion Mm -hmm. and you can kind of create that scenario and, or really any scenario that you want. The other, the hard part though, I'd say particularly with an animal like a bear, like you're saying, like they've got that short attention span. You mm-hmm. almost have to keep that constant calling once yeah. you start is, you know, that takes a lot of air volume. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. I've gotten many headaches, uh, calling, calling bears, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, exciting nonetheless. And, and like you said, you know, definitely something you want to have in in your, I guess, you know, your tool bag while you're out there. It's, it's one of those things where even if you're not planning on calling, like if I'm just going out on a, you know, going out on a rifle hunt with some buddies, there is always a predator call in my bino harness Mm -hmm. because I've, I've gotten several shots at bears with a rifle where I wasn't, I was like, I'm setting up on this water source about 200 yards away. I'm sitting here, but I got to call with me just in case a bear, if a bear comes out and he goes into a thicket, Right. So I killed a bear like that. I shot two bears like that, went into a thicket, and they just, I started calling. They just came out curiously. Right. I'm like, what, where is that? You know? And then I got a shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's a useful tool for sure. You're not, you're not going to pull them into 10 yards like that, but it'll give you a shot opportunity. Yeah. All you, all you just need to get them, you know, like in that scenario, just get them to step out and yeah. look, you know? And that could save you, you know, that could be the difference between uh, getting him or not, you know, or if maybe he's bedded down and I, or I should ask this question. I was, I was kind of, uh, I guess, speculating, but maybe it's, uh, you know, getting towards the end of the day mm-hmm. and, you, and you think that bear is still in there, mm-hmm. right? You know, have you ever had a scenario where you're like, uh, daylight's waning or do you think those bears generally, if you're kind of feel like you're on one, he's going to get up while you still have enough time to shoot? Yeah. I've never really had it to where, the bear outweighed me. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because like most, even when it's really hot, what I've noticed is like once three o'clock hits, Mm -hmm. a lot of times they're getting up and walking around. It's usually in a shaded area. Okay. They're not going to come out on like a big sunny slope most of the time, but Mm -hmm. down in the water, maybe they'll, maybe they'll come jump in a, in a spring, go for a swim, pop up into the shade, nibble on some food a little bit. You know what I mean? And then as like, darkness falls they'll meander out in other areas gosh this bear life just sounds relaxing it's it's swim eat fiddle around for a while take a nap yeah it's a simple life man (laughs) (laughs) god i'm just trying to think they're they're such a they're such a cool animal you know and and like you said they do differ from deer and elk when when you do get some some time to to watch them Mm -hmm. 
they're fun to watch. Oh, absolutely. They do all sorts of wild stuff. Yeah, I love anytime I get to go out, even if I, like, I don't have a tag, mm -hmm. I just like going out and watching them, you know, because you just never know. You never know what you're going to see. You never know, like, when. Because in general, like, if you see a bear in one area, mm -hmm. there's other ones. Okay. Because that bear's gotcha. there for a reason. That's where the food's at. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about, so we talked, you know, that season is so, I guess, liberal, or, or oh, yeah. I guess the multiple seasons are liberal. If you have a bear tag, do you have to pick one of those specific seasons, or is a single tag valid for multiple seasons, but you just have to be within the boundaries of that season? Yeah, what the, your one tag, your one bear tag, over-the-counter tag is good for every single general hunt there is. Okay. Yeah, throughout the year. And how the hunts operate, uh, this, is, this is up to you as the hunter. We have sow harvest limits. Okay, right. Within, like, each unit in Arizona has a sow limit. Gotcha. Okay, so this unit here might have two. This one might have seven. You know, so you need to monitor that. Right. So we, we have a bear hotline. Okay. Okay, so you need to call in that hotline to make sure, oh, okay, unit whatever is going to close this day at sundown. And typically how it works is, Units always close down. Say the hunt opens on Friday. Mm -hmm. You know absolutely without, with, without a doubt you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to hunt. Okay. Okay. If a unit shuts down in that time, it will shut down on Wednesday at sundown. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Like if on Friday the sow limit is met, okay. you still have until Wednesday to hunt that unit. Okay. But then gotcha. after that, you need to go kick rocks and find another place. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's really important, man. Like, I mean, super uh, common mistake, you know, people being out hunting in areas that they're not supposed to be in. Right. So, right. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So that, yeah, I mean, and I guess that probably puts um, some onus or, you know, you definitely want to be uh, cognizant yeah. of, you know, trying to watch that bear, mm -hmm. you know, may try and make sure, not that it would be illegal to take that sow, but, you know, if, if you want the unit to stay open, you know, yeah. you don't want to reach that, reach that sow quota. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I should say that each, not only does each unit have a sow limit, but each season has a sow limit. Okay. Okay. So, so let's say you're talking unit one. Okay. In the springtime, if unit one meets its sow limit, mm -hmm. you will be able to hunt unit one in the fall because it'll reopen gotcha. unless the annual sow limit is met in that unit. Like each unit has an annual limit. Okay, gotcha. Most of the time this doesn't happen, but sometimes things get crazy. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And, it, and it's really on what, when that happens is when they come down into the prickly pears. Okay. Because a lot of times you don't even need binoculars. Okay. Just, yeah. The just, mile away, there's a big black thing walking around the hill. You know, so kind of stand out like a yeah. sore thumb. Yeah. So. so it's usually kind of a slaughter fest when that happens. Interesting. My goodness. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's interesting. So that yeah, like you definitely want to be on your game. Yeah. I mean, probably calling in every day. I guess. Do you have to call? Do you call in every day or no? Not? No. Like if you go, like, like me, if your hunt opens on Friday, I would call like on Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Okay. You're totally, it's totally legal the whole time during that whole time. Okay. But once that first Wednesday comes, you have to call. Right. To make sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, what, what I always, I always like, or try to ask people, like, what's your, what's your optics arsenal look like? Cause everybody's got their own little, I guess their preferences or what they like. And a lot of that's dictated by the country that they're in. Right. So mm -hmm. like, what's your, what's your optics arsenal look like for, you know, and, and does it change between deer and bear and elk or is it pretty much the same? It's, it's pretty much the same. I, I really like tens mm -hmm. to wear on my chest and particularly just because I can wear them on my chest and it's not, they're not huge. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, it's a little easier. Like if you do come into a dense area, a lot of times if you're still hunting okay. through an area, you can use those to glass 50 yards in front of you. You know what I mean? Like sure. it, they're not so much magnification that you have no field of view. You know, a lot of guys, particularly that are hunting the prickly pears, mm -hmm. 15s, rule the earth right on those things <laughs> right and it's and that's really common with coos deer hunting too like 15, yep. 15 by 56 is like the king of the desert and whether i bring a spotting scope or not really depends on how big the country is i'm looking at sure you know like in most areas 
honestly, I don't bring a spotting scope. Right. But there are areas that I, that I have in my back pocket where it's like, yeah, I need, I need that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's just big. You're glassing over a mile away. So yeah. yeah. And definitely on a tripod. Yeah. Definitely mounted on a tripod. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, that's definitely, uh, seems like for sure an Arizona staple, you know, yeah. tripod glassing. And then that's, that's where I first, you know, kind of encountered that was chasing coos deer in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And like, it just like opened my eyes and really changed my glassing for a lot of the hunts that I go on, like any open landscape, you know, Western mm-hmm. hunt, mm-hmm. man, if I can, you know, have a tripod and tripod glass, that's just, we can't, you know, emphasize that enough. So, and, and I really like, so I, I run tens as binos. I really like a 65 mm-hmm. as a spotting scope yep. just because it's not like, there's a lot of dudes that like 80, like the bigger ones. The 65 for me is, it's not too big. It's not too small. Like you can reach out and touch stuff a mm-hmm. long ways away and it fits great in a backpack. Yep. So that's kind of, that's kind of the route that I go with those. Yeah. That's, that's my go-to as well. And, and if I was going to pick an all around, you know, like I said, and, and I know guys that, man, they pack the 85, you know, they want that top end of, of 60, mm-hmm. but I definitely gravitate towards that kind of that middle ground of the six, uh, the 65 millimeter spot, or like you said, you got you're saving a little weight, the space, it's more packable, but you know, you're Mm -hmm. still going at least in our lineup, you know, with that Razor HD, I believe you're still, you know, you're going up to uh, 48, which Mm -hmm. is, I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of magnification. And I think one thing, you know, a lot of people focus on the top end and and I've Mm -hmm. talked about this before, like, oh, you know, it's the, you know, what's that top end number. But I think that low end number is really important too, depending on the terrain and where you're glassing. Cause you know, if you're, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of like I guess the our Razor HD series, you know, in particular, the 85 millimeter version, which I love, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But it's got a low end of a 22, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes that's a little much for what you're actually trying to do with it, or maybe you're trying to acquire that subject, mm-hmm. and it's just a little bit more difficult with that uh, narrow narrow field of view. Yeah, the, I mean, quite honestly, the only time I find myself just cranking in on the zoom is when I actually spot something. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I mean, I'm trying to get as wide of a field of view as I can when you're actually glassing. Mm -hmm. It just makes it easier. But then it's so nice. Just, you know, you spot a bear like in a bush, just kind of meandering around eating. You can just zone in on that bear and really see, you know, what color he is, how big he is, you know, just stuff like that. Does it have cubs? Absolutely. So that's another thing I should probably mention. Uh, you are not allowed to shoot a sow with cubs. Right. Which is, I think it's pretty well that's, across the that's board. That's pretty much a staple, I'd <laughs> yeah. say, by and large, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, and probably another good reason to have the spotter, right? You yeah. Know, you know, maybe even with your naked eye, you might be able to spot a bear, you know, or you got your 10s or, or your 18s or 12s on a tripod, but really being able to kind of get in there, you know, particularly in some of that thicker country that you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, you know, that could come in pretty darn handy. Yeah. You never know. And I would watch a bear for a bit, you know, not like an hour or anything like that, but mm-hmm. make sure like I, one time I had a bear, I was sitting down on a water source and I had a beautiful blonde, orange looking bear walk out into, to come for a swim. And I was like, I was getting ready to draw my bow back. And then all of a sudden two little cubs popped out. Right. You know, it's like if I, if they, if they waited another 15 seconds, mm-hmm. I might've been in trouble. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that was my bad, but definitely make, try to make sure, yep. you know, look around the cubs aren't always right with their mom. Yep. You know, I would like scan around, like maybe in a 50 yard radius of that, of that bear just to see, yep. you know, yeah, which is difficult to do, right? Because yeah. you spot that bear, you get, at least I know for me, right? You get hyper-focused and you almost have to have like, almost like a checklist, mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, wait a minute. Cool. We found a bear. But now let's really try and sort out, like, make sure this bear is alone. And this is, I think this is particularly common in Arizona because we're not dealing with, we are not drowning in bears. Okay. okay? We have a good population. I think, I think last I checked, our population is right around, Game of Fish is saying it's right around 3,000 bears. Something like Washington, Washington is like 10,000 bears. Yeah. Okay. So it can be hard to find them. Right. So in the case that you're talking about, it's like, yeah, you see a bear. Oh my goodness. Maybe you didn't see a bear for five days before that. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's like when you see that, I think your automatic instinct is, where's my rifle? Where's my rifle? You know, and you want to shoot this bear right away, but you really need to take the time to make sure, you know, you don't break the law. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then we touched on this a little bit earlier, but these bear seasons are running concurrently with a lot of, you know, you're talking about deer seasons, right? Mm -hmm. So having a bear, bear tag in your pocket, 
it could be potentially that maybe your primary hunt could be a deer hunt, mm-hmm. but you kind of throw that bonus tag in your pocket if, if something happens yeah. so, or, or if you spot one, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this also happens during the rifle coos deer hunt. Okay. okay. So we have a rifle coos deer hunt. It usually opens uh, end of October. Right. This is bear season, obviously depending on if units are still open, but I've heard many stories of guys that are like, yeah, we're just not seeing deer, but we're seeing a bunch of bears. So it turned into a bear hunt. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and particularly, man, you know, as, as an out of stater, yeah, it's, it's more money, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to buy another tag, but gosh, you have so much invested in that hunt already just to give yourself that, you know, that extra, uh, opportunity or heck you might come home with a deer and a bear, yeah, right? You, or, you very well could. So say you, know, you say you fill your deer tag early. Right. You know, you, you're here for six days. You fill your deer tag on day two. You got another four days of hunting. You know what I mean? Might as well have a bear tag. You might as well have a bear tag. And I can tell you, man, coos deer and bears are probably two of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, it's almost like uh, it's like peanut butter and chocolate. Oh, yeah. You know? It's like, holy mackerel. Yeah, they just go together. Yeah. Yeah, they're peas and carrots. Um, and to be able to, you know, hunt both at the same time. Yeah. What, what a cool thing. So. And I've found... Habitat wise, they usually are kind of around the same areas. Okay. Coos deer, in my opinion, coos deer are very, very adaptable. They can live like anywhere. Right. But you do find them in these like really rugged areas. Okay. You gotcha. Know? And um, the bears are in those areas too. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, it's definitely possible to have more than one, more than one tag. Oh man, I'm trying to think if I got any more, any, any other tips or final thoughts on, on this hunt or... The best tip, two tips, best two tips I can give is rewinding back, do your research on food. Okay. You will learn more about plants than you ever wanted to learn about plants if you want to be a bear hunter, no matter if you're hunting in Arizona or Idaho or whatever. Okay. The tip number two is persistence. So I I took a first timer out last year, actually it was two years ago. He got a hold of me and he's like, he wanted to learn about bear hunting. He never did it before. And I was like... Absolutely, man. I'll let you know, I'll take you out scouting. I'll kind of show you, show you the ropes. Awesome. Took him out that whole first year, showed him plants and, oh, bears eat this this time of year. This is this is a good water source right here. I normally find bears on, blah, blah, blah. He never saw a bear that year. Okay. Okay. Right. Super discouraging. You know yeah. what I mean? He was out there in August, blazing hot sun, getting eaten by mosquitoes. <laughs> Putting <laughs> I mean? in the work. Yeah. Never saw a bear. Goes out the following year with me and... It was just different. Mm-hmm. Like we had a better winter rain. We had acorns. We're walking into a spot and I'm like, look, here's all the acorns. And then we found a fresh pile of bear scat and he's, his eyes just lit up, you know, he's yep. like, this is it, man. Yep. I'm like, yeah, dude. So, uh, that night he shot his first bear. No way. Yeah. Really cool, man. Really cool story. And it was awesome too, because he had never had to do, he, he came from the Midwest, you know what I mean? He did some deer hunting over there, mm-hmm. but he never did something as wild as this. Like he, we were in the bottom of this canyon in the pitch black, bears are walking around. We got no this way. bear opened up, skinning this bear, he's cutting meat off, blah, blah, blah. Just this really cool experience. Yeah. And then packing this bear out. I remember when we got everything loaded up on the packs, he's like, all right, which way? And I pointed, I was like, right that way, man. He looked over, he's like, what do you mean? Because there was no path. It was just like this rock wall. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, we got to go up that. (laughs) 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 So um, the reward, what I'm getting at is the reward at the end of the tunnel is worth it. Yep. And a lot of people get very discouraged because they can't find bears. Yeah. And all I can tell you is if you go out for five, six days and you don't see a bear, you're not, it's not like you're doing something wrong. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. And that's good to know too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like don't call yourself a bad bear hunter. Sometimes this is how it goes. You know, I went all spring last year from April, like end of March until June. I saw my first bear in June. Wow. Okay. And I knew where to look. (laughs) Okay. Okay. The year before that, I saw eight bears in April. Okay. So it was just, it's, and what was different was it was the moisture. Okay. It was just a different year. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you stick with it. And I'm telling you, when you see that first one, you are just going to, you're just going to, you're going to be changed, man. 
because <laughs> it is different. They just, they almost float along a hill. Yep. You know, it's really cool. That's cool. You know, and you know, I mean, that's just a really, really big tip. If you're thinking about embarking on this hunt, you know, really maybe pay attention or research, you know, kind of what has the weather done, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. kind of on a, on a more annual, not, not what's the, not what's the weather going to be like next week. Mm-hmm. You know, what did mm-hmm. the weather do this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can find this stuff out, you know, um, there's plenty of apps out there like go hunt keeps track of moisture levels every gotcha. year, mm-hmm. you know, so you can kind of see like, Oh, this place has been really dry the past couple of years, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I want to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Y- you got to put in that, that type of work. And then, and then you can go, uh, like right now you can look up, we're at like 350% our moisture level in Arizona right now through the winter. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So it's shaping up to be a great year for fall bear hunting. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so any resources I know, so, or any other resources, I know when I was researching javelina mm-hmm. for, for the, uh, actually, I guess it was this year, the game and fish website kind of had an overlay, mm-hmm. you know, so you could see kind of like, oh, javelina are kind of like inhabit like this part of this unit mm-hmm. or this part of that unit. I'd assume, do they have that for bears as well? Absolutely. Okay. And that, and that right there, whether you're coming from out of state or you're, you live in Arizona, I think that is the the first step you need to do. Okay. You go on the game of fish site and they have a section on there called where to hunt. Mm-hmm. You can click on that. You can click on uh, specific units and, you know, say you click on this unit, it'll have every single species that's in that unit. Right. With a kind of a breakdown of air, like starting points. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe like a certain road to go down certain canyons to possibly check out. Uh, They're not going to tell you where the, you know what I mean? But everybody has to have a, a, a point A. Yeah. Right. And that right there is incredibly helpful. That'll get you, get you to off to the races. Cool. Yeah. Cool, man. I love it. I'm pumped. I want to, dude, I've been thinking about this hunt. I don't know when I'm going to get to do it. I definitely want to get to do it someday because I've been thinking about it for like the last 10 years, but yeah, um, <laughs> it just, it just seems, it seems like just like a cool one, you know? It so. is. It is really cool. Well, I appreciate the time, man. Thanks. Yeah, no. Hey, thanks for having me on. Anytime you want to chat, let me know. Super fun, man. Cool. Appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, Mark. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, Maybe grab a little nugget of information that you could take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.